Hi, everyone. I'm so thrilled to be here and among such awesome company. Um, I mean, honestly, it's times like this that I almost can't believe this is my life. So thank you so much for having me. It's been an incredible past year or so for me, and I've been fortunate to travel around the country talking to people about my book. In the course of that travel, I've been to a number of schools, and those are some of my favorite events that I do, partly because the students ask questions that no adult would dare ask. <laughs> I love it. They're like, how old are you? <laughs> and how much money do you make? <laughs> but one of the questions that students ask me again and again is how I knew that I wanted to be a writer. And I thought I would share with you the story that I tell them. It begins, as so many things do, with a boy that I liked in high school. <laughs> and when I tell you that I liked him, I mean that I was soul-crushingly in love with him. We were friends. He was a skateboarder, and he listened to punk rock, and he was intensely smart. And during study hall, sometimes we would do the Sunday New York Times crossword puzzle together. And sometimes we would play Scrabble. And once, I remember, he played the word bivouac. And because I was a word nerd even back then, I was like, oh my god, I love you. <laughs> and I would go around all the time trying to tell him how I felt about him. So we would be at a party at someone's house, and I would somehow steer him into a corner, and I would be like, I really like you. And I would call him late at night, and I would be like, I really like you. And eventually, he got really sick of it. <laughs> so he came into school one day with a blank journal that he had bought, and he handed me the journal, and he said, why don't you write down everything you want to say to me for a year and then give this back to me. <laughs> so I took the journal home and I started writing. And at first the entries were really just to him. You know, they were about how great he looked in calculus that day or <laughs> the funny thing he had said in biology. But after about three weeks, something changed. Three weeks into it, it occurred to me how much I loved just sitting down at the end of every day and writing, just the sheer act of it. In the journal, I could be anybody I wanted to be, and I could say anything I wanted to say, and I could use all of the language that my parents would have killed me for using. It was a real place of liberation for me. So I kept writing in the journal for the full year, and at the end of it, everyone always wants to know, did I give it back to him? I did. And he read it, and he thanked me, and nothing happened. <laughs> but by then, it almost didn't matter, because what had happened was that I had fallen out of love with the boy, and I had fallen in love with writing. I never looked back after that. I studied creative writing as an undergrad, and then got my MFA. I wrote a short story collection and a novel, and now the Book of Unknown Americans, which brings me here today. Now, when I was in college, there was no such thing as a first year experience program, at least not at Northwestern, which is where I went. But I have to tell you, it would have meant so much to me if there had been. I knew by the time I enrolled that I wanted to pursue writing, but I had no idea practically what that would look like and whether I was really cut out for it. I would have been psyched to have a writer come to our campus. And I can only imagine how much it would have meant to me to see not only a writer, but a writer of color, and not only a writer of color, but a woman writer of color, which is to say, a writer who looked in any way like me. I'm half Panamanian from my father's side, and though I was born in the United States and have spent my whole life here, Nearly every summer, my family and I went to Panama to visit my relatives there. One of the great pleasures of those trips was always that my parents would take my siblings and I to the bookstore before we left and let us pick out books to read on the plane. I was a quiet child, shy in almost every situation. 
the world felt to me big and overwhelming, but in books, I found a kind of refuge, a place where I could be quiet, a world that felt welcoming and warm. And yet within that world, I never saw any Latina characters, not in the pages of Encyclopedia Brown, nor the Boxcar Children, nor Nancy Drew, nor Little House on the Prairie. As a young girl, I never gave it much thought. I read along happily, and I felt connected to those books as fiercely as I felt connected to anything. It wasn't until later when I was in graduate school, fumbling my way toward becoming a writer myself, that I realized that all that time, something for me had been missing. One day, I went to a used bookstore and came home with an edition of the Oxford Book of American Short Stories. I stood in my bedroom and started flipping through the tissue-thin pages, reading a snatch of words here and there. And then I happened upon an excerpt from The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros, an author I had never heard of until that moment. I read the excerpt greedily. And as I read, I felt the shock of recognition, a jolt that sliced me right open on the spot. People could write about this? You could put a character named Carlos in a story, and you could write about lottery tickets and laundromats, and it could still be considered literature? Who knew? And why hadn't anybody told me earlier? All those years, all those books that I had read and loved, and what they had all said to me in a way so quiet, I didn't even realize I was hearing them, was that the Anglo part of me was what was important. The Anglo part of me was the part worth showing. The Anglo part of me was the part with value. Unwittingly, the message sunk in. I knew that it had because every story I was writing by then was set in the United States and featured white characters. I never even considered that I could write about the Panamanian side of myself about all of those experiences I had accumulated after a lifetime of visiting my relatives there. It didn't occur to me that anybody wanted to hear those stories. Preening roosters in the backyard and rain-drenched parties on the patio, none of that belonged in a story. Or so, I realized suddenly, I mistakenly believed. There's a push going on lately for diverse literature, and this is why it's so important. When you see yourself, when young people, people of color, girls, everyone who is marginalized, everyone who feels unrecognized and unknown, sees themselves in books and on television and music and film, there's a confirmation of the self that occurs. People start to believe that they have stories worth telling. They start to believe that they are worth something, too. But there are two functions of literature. One is to see yourself. The other is to see beyond yourself. As important as it would have been for me to have seen myself in books, I have to believe that it would have been equally important for my classmates, who might not have seen themselves, but who would have been given an opportunity to see beyond themselves. You know, I think there's this myth that diversity is for one group or another, but it isn't. It's for all of us. A book is many things, and my novel is a love story between two teenagers. It's about parents trying to do the best thing for their daughter. It's about immigrants from all over Latin America who all live in one apartment building together in Delaware. But it's really about the multitude of stories in the world, the importance of telling them, and the necessity of listening. I did an event at the University of Tennessee last fall, and before I got there, I arranged to speak with some of the employees on campus, a woman named Aminata from the housekeeping department and a man named Getachu, both of whom were immigrants. And in my talk, I told the students a little bit about them people who otherwise they might have overlooked. I told them how Aminata dreamt of being a pharmacist when she was little and how she loves listening to Rihanna. 
how Getachew's favorite food is spaghetti, and how on the 4th of July he drove in his Honda to Washington, D.C. and toured the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial, getting to know the country that he now calls home. I wanted to make the themes of the book feel personal to the students, but I also wanted to break open the world for them just a little bit, to push them to see beyond themselves. And after that event, you wouldn't believe how many students thanked me for what I said. It was also in Tennessee that a boy asked me one of my favorite questions ever. He wanted to know why Maribel had to be beautiful. He said, next time, can you write a girl who isn't beautiful? And there was so much loaded into that question. Acknowledgement of stereotypes and gender constraints. And I told him that he was in luck, because that's the book I'm working on now. In California, a boy named Tomas told me that when he read a line from the book out loud to his parents at the dinner table, it was the line where Fito says, if people want to tell me to go home, I just turn to them and smile politely and say, I'm already there. And how when his mother heard it, she cried. That this book might connect young people to their parents' stories was something I didn't anticipate. At an event in Illinois recently, a teacher who assigned the book to his students and who brought them all to meet me, we did like a million selfies that day, told me that this was the first book many of them had read. And not just for my class, he clarified, but ever. It took me five years to write the Book of Unknown Americans. I nearly abandoned it at least twice. But I kept going because it was personal to me. It's a story that was inspired by my father, who came to the United States from Panama when he was 18. I wanted to pay homage not only to his journey, but to his experience in this country. I wanted to tell a different kind of immigrant story. That's really all I set out to do. But when I hear those responses from students, what can you say to things like that? What can you do other than to feel deeply honored? And I do. It would be an honor to share the book with some of your students as well. Thank you.